to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here today with John Harrigan and Bill Schofield. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. Doing well. Great. 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 Well, it's great to be with you, and uh, to all our listeners, it's great to have you. Uh, we're excited. This is our first episode of this podcast, and uh, before we really get into any of the themes and ideas, just a little bit of an overview of what we want to talk about on this podcast, we want to take a little bit of time just to introduce ourselves and uh, tell you a little bit about who we are and how we came to look at the material we're going to be talking about. So uh, let's start with Bill. How are you doing today, Bill? And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hey, um my name's Bill Schofield, and uh, glad to be on. Real excited to be doing the podcast. Um, so I am. Uh, I live in Northern California. I'm married with uh, seven kids. I've uh, been married for eighteen years, I think now. And so we, my wife and I, help oversee uh, a small community up here in Northern California. And uh, like I said, raised seven children, so keeps pretty busy. We're it's the perfect um, number. <laughs> <clears throat> that's what they say. That's why we stopped. <laughs> but <clears throat> but um, I uh, so I guess relevant information about me is uh, so I'm a, I'm a missionary's kid. So I was raised in Central America on the mission field, and and uh, that pretty much colors uh come to find that pretty much colors every everything I see in the world uh but so I moved back to the states in the late 90s and uh you know kind of dove into uh christian world here and just met just ended up over time just getting really Frustrated with the uh, with the shallowness and the and the lack of substance, both in the message and in the practice of the Western Church, and uh, it eventually led me to just a period of just kind of taking a time out. <clears throat> and uh, the time out was was truly to to dive into the scriptures, and I just needed a time to reduce the noise. So I spent some time diving into the scriptures, and a lot of it really revolved around trying to frame context. And so, you know, during this period, a couple year period, real intensely, and then kind of just set me on a different course, just spent time diving into the early Christian writings, um, first few centuries, and then led me to Second Temple literature. And then, of course, can't really dive into all of that without the relevant historical studies, and so uh, kind of led me to really dive into the all of the academic conversations that were happening in relation to those things. So basically how I not only came here to, you know, to the podcast, but also how I met John and Josh as well. And uh, I think that's I think that's about it for an introduction. I'm sure there'll be more things that come up over time. Oh, that's great. That's great. So Northern California, what's that? Uh, what's that like living in California? You know, I mean, I grew up on. Well, I'll share a little bit of my story. I grew up on the East Coast, and so you know, California to me is like uh, half a world away. Yeah. So I I was born in the Midwest in Missouri, and then uh, and then, like I said, gr- grew up in Guatemala. So. Yeah, everywhere is foreign to me. Everywhere is is like another world. Third culture kid. Some of you out there know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's it's an unusual place. Redding's kind of a little, uh, an odd little place in California. Kind of doesn't fit any of the California stereotypes, but it's kind of up. It's hot. To, yeah, it's really hot in the summer. It's, uh, it's at about two hours north of Sacramento and... Yeah, it's it's a good place. Um, good good community here. Really enjoy uh, being here with the folks that are here. So that's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, John, 
tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I'm, uh, uh, I work in the Middle East with an evangelical mission organization. Uh, I live in Cairo. We help train new missionaries on the field and uh, to transition to long-term work in the Middle East. And uh, so uh, we're in the States here for a few more uh, a few more months until uh, until the summer, we'll head back. Um, uh, we had to come home for medical issues for our kids. I've started working on a, a doctoral thesis. So uh, I came into uh, historical studies uh, out of necessity, I guess. I, I wasn't raised in the church at all, and so I became a believer. Um, 25 years ago or so, and uh, wasn't uh, wasn't raised in the church, never opened a Bible, but encountered God in college, and uh, so after that, tried that kind of set me on a trajectory of figuring out what I said yes to and what the cross and eternal life meant to a, a first century Jew and. You, you, there's really no way to uh, to get answers around those subjects except his- historical studies. So that's that's what set uh, set my life in that direction. Um, and uh, so I also uh, just personally have have four kids, not seven. So I haven't attained to the glory yet. Uh, but uh, or the sleeplessness, right. you still get a little bit of sleep uh, my, from time to time. My kids are beyond that stage, so been uh, just celebrated twenty one years of marriage and uh, and awesome. Uh, so anyway, that's a little about myself. Oh, that's great. That's great. So Cairo, um, I I was uh, involved with missions for a little bit and had a chance to to go to Cairo for just a short term missions trip, and we worked with a, a church there, but. Uh, just in terms of the church there in Cairo, unbelievable amount of history, of course. But uh, what's it like ministering in a Muslim country, uh, I guess primarily a Muslim country? Um, or, I mean, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, yeah, just in terms of, of reaching out to um, unbelievers there, Muslims. I mean, what is it you primarily encounter in terms of, uh, in terms of being able to share the, the gospel? With people there, yeah. I mean, Egypt is about ninety percent Muslim, nine uh, percent Coptic, which is kind of like Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and then one percent everything else: Evangelical, Catholic, Protestant, uh, Charismatic, Pentecostal. So uh, it's not a it's not a large church uh, by any means, and uh, the culture is definitely Islamic. Uh, Cairo is the city of 10,000 minarets, and there's a mosque literally on every corner. Uh, and so it's definitely uh, generally a conservative culture. There is, uh, especially among the, among the youth, uh, trends towards disillusionment and atheism, but that's not a large percentage by and large. It's a uh, uh, moderate, uh, uh, conservative devout. Um, and there is definitely a lot of uh, radical and and kind of orthodox Islam with Al-Azhar there. And so. Wow. Wow. Well, thanks for that, both you guys. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of uh, background myself. Um, you know, as I said in the intro, my name is Josh Hawkins, and uh, I've been in full-time ministry now for, I guess, about 16 years, um, but didn't start there. Um, I I was raised in a good Christian home, like I'm sure many here in, in the South and in America, um, but uh, didn't really begin to take my faith seriously until I was, uh, I guess, in college um, and uh, graduated from a university uh, with a degree in computer science uh, and started working, but then really felt the Lord tugging on my heart, um, just the reality of missions and uh and, and worship and prayer and, and these things. And the Lord really stirred me to leave my job and uh, jump into a ministry and missions internship where uh, I really began to interact with uh, a, a lot of people um, who really just had a heart for the scriptures and uh, to, to know the scriptures deeply and to understand the scriptures. And 
uh, really, I guess, my journey uh, into really this material that we're going to be speaking about on the podcast really began uh, through a, a study, kind of a long study on the life of Christ uh, and and the details of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, really that, in many ways, like with both of you, led me to really begin to study the history uh, of how uh, different ideas were interpreted and understood and, and really just uh, stirred me to understand the context of Jesus's life and words. And so that led me to uh, uh, really down a, a rabbit hole, uh, a good rabbit hole, <laughs> um, that it, you end up emerging on the other end with uh, a lot more clarity and understanding. And so uh, it's it's been quite a journey for me as well. But right now, I have the awesome privilege of ministering among college students at Texas A&M University here in, in Texas as a, uh, a student pastor, a college pastor, I guess you could say. Uh, and... Uh, just really an amazing thing to be able to sow into young people where, you know, they, they come from all sorts of different churches, different homes, different places all across Texas, and even all, all across the world. Uh, Texas A&M University is really filled with um, a, a large number of international students. And so uh, in many ways, I, I feel like, you know, it's a, it's a mission field in and of itself, but uh, it's an awesome thing to see students um, kind of while they're the the cement of their hearts is still a little wet, you know, where they've come from um, Johnny Youth Pastor and and uh, Robert Senior Pastor, and and they come to the university and they say, okay, well, am I going to follow Jesus still? Is this my faith or is this my parents' faith? Uh, and so it's just an amazing thing and an awesome privilege to be able to to minister to students at really one of the most critical times of their lives and and sow the reality of the scriptures and the hope of the age to come and the day of the Lord into them um, during that time. So uh, that's what I get to do here in Texas, and uh, I'm I'm super grateful for it. But yeah, ton of fun, ton of fun. So well, well, good. Now, before we get um, to uh, talking about more of the content of this podcast, let's talk for a little bit about why did we even want to start a podcast? Um, what are we doing and, and what led us to think about this, to talk about this and really say, okay, we're, we're going to work through all the technical details, you know, because we're all in different cities and, and working through all of these details to make this podcast happen. Um, you know, we want to help disciples of Jesus understand the gospel and to live in light of it. So why did we even think about this? So what's our motivation? I think, I think I had the original idea for it and I kind of pitched it to you guys. Um, we do blame you for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fine. It's just fine. Um, I, I think, you know, mostly, mostly had in mind that, uh, you know, the, the truth is, is that the Bible is an ancient text. It's an ancient, you know, ancient Semitic text, which, which makes it doubly foreign to the modern Westerner, and and that's and that's just a necessary challenge. And and generally, generally speaking, the folks that actually believe the content of the text minimize that idea and try to make it more easily approachable than it might be at face value. And um, meaning that you can open it up, and whatever seems to mean to you is what it means. And uh, secondly, the, the only ones who really emphasize that it is a doubly foreign text are, are generally speaking, don't actually believe it a whole lot. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the reason for another one in my mind has to do with simply the, the fact that discipleship is informed by what the gospel says, um, in the sense of, without, you know, going into too much detail, the gospel, um, which, which is kind of embodied in the, the title, the gospel being, having an eschatological thrust as it does, had originally the mechanism to actually keep disciples and, 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 and kind of strengthen them with endurance and faith within the message itself. And over time, that having been lost, 
it's kind of been stripped of that ability. And generally speaking, you know, Western Christianity has tried to make up for that with programs and and different mechanisms so that people can remain engaged because the message itself has ceased to engage and has ceased to be a constant source of faith and grace from God. So our, my hope in the situation is that we could simply um, do what we're, we're going to do and help establish the listeners in some sure footing so that it might the simple message of the scriptures might again be a source of strength, encouragement, and, and grace from God to persevere in uh, the days ahead. So that's really my intention. Yeah, and I think we've, you know, we've experienced trying to get some background and answers to questions about what first century Jews believed, what, uh, what the assumptions are, how they viewed the universe, how they viewed time and history and the future, how they, the things that they understood, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist appear preaching the kingdom of God's at hand. Nobody asked them what the kingdom is. It's not defined in, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Right. Uh, and so how do you get answers? Where do you go? And when you journey down that path, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to, to get answers and clarity. And, and so I think another part of the goal of this podcast is to kind of translate that world yeah. uh, into the normal world with a spirit of faith to, uh, to receive truth from that and not discount it. And also take seriously that Jesus and the disciples were actually first century Jews. Yeah, and that's right. uh, and the the scriptures are fundamental, fundamentally ethnically bound by covenant and uh, shaped yeah. in in the narrative that way. And and so when you get into the academic world uh, and scholarly debate, it you get a de-ethnicizing of the scriptures by various means, and there's a hundred different camps, and they're all warring against each other, and so it can become fairly overwhelming, and so we want to help uh, help translate that. It's also the season of apocalyptic. We're in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> the world. The world is apocalyptic, and uh, yeah. everybody seems to be talking about it, so the yeah. timing seems to be right. And additionally, the you know, one of the one of the other more practical features of diving into the diving into the ap- academic conversations because it's not just academic literature; they're like long discussions that take place over time. And the reason, the other reason why that's helpful is because even if it doesn't seem immediately relevant to you, that's just because you don't understand that the complex conversation from fifty years ago is now normative in every pulpit. And so it's coming to a pulpit near you, whether you know it or not. It's just it'll, it'll most likely come through a lens that is, uh, that is, like John said, complicated by the noise of the you know, 500 different opinions, uh, which are all trying to make the scriptures Christian instead of Jewish. Yeah, yeah, huge point. And, you know, I, I think... Both of you are bringing up something really important that I think we definitely want our listeners to understand is that there really is this disconnect oftentimes between the academy, meaning scholars, historians, and then what the average pastor preaches on a Sunday morning. And sometimes that disconnect is never really addressed um, and or sometimes it takes a while for those things to kind of matriculate down from the scholarly level down to the popular level. But then with all of these different opinions and ideas, it gets really difficult to sort out. Mm -hmm. Um, But our heart really is just to bring clarity in terms of what the academy is saying um, and then ultimately how those things affect discipleship. And and you mentioned, Bill, you said that uh, that this really the eschatological thrust of the gospel is something that we want to emphasize. Um, you know, for our listeners, could you take a second just explain, you know, if they maybe never heard of that term eschatology or eschatological before, um, you know, what does that mean? And, and describe that a little bit more for our listeners, if you could. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so John John brought up a good example, like, uh, you know, very early scenes of the gospel before 
uh, of the I'm sorry of the Gospels before uh, before a whole lot of content is actually laid out. You have both John the Baptist and Jesus preaching about the kingdom of God, and and like John said, nobody says, "Oh, well, what on earth is the kingdom of God?" and but that has to do with the conversations that were taking place in the literature that was that was written in that period called the second second temple period is usually how it's called and basically it involved a thrust of of viewing the scriptures and the oracles of God with a with a thrust towards the future and and Perhaps at one point they just kind of had a general future thrust because prophecy that hasn't happened is obviously future. But at some point they were kind of compiled together, and they and it was um, and it was assumed that there was basically a day coming when God would fulfill the things that were spoken by the prophets, and and so by the time you get to that period, this is a str- very literal. A very literal day. Yeah, a very a very literal day. And 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 so there's and so things like the kingdom of God, phrases like uh salvation, um I, I mean so we'll we'll go into a bunch of them that that were became normative in the New Testament, were normative because of the conversation about an eschatological day when God would accomplish these things. And uh, from the resurrection, the day of the Lord, the the judgment, Gehenna, you know, all of these things. And and really, an- another thing you find in the New Testament is you find reference to to obviously there's a lot of conversation about faith, and faith had much more to do with this thing that we're talking about than anything else. This is the framework they not only understood it in; it's the framework that it was always talked about. Like <clears throat> Habakkuk 2 is referenced often in the New Testament, or is referenced a handful of times, but it's, it, it clearly in their mind represents what faith looks like in addition to the episode with Abraham in Genesis. But in Habakkuk 2, the, the familiar phrase is, and the, and the righteous will live by faith. And, uh, but the idea in context actually has to do with with the credibility of the oracle that God just pronounced to Habakkuk. And God, God basically explains to Habakkuk that there will be two responses to the oracle. One will be to actually brace yourself and consider the oracle reliable. So the oracle meaning the Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. Yeah, so, from Habakkuk 1. Right. Yeah. So how did the, the hearers respond in light of that? Right. One will respond in what he calls faith, will actually conform their lives to, to, the, to that oracle, assuming it reliable. And uh, others will not. And others will, their heart is not right within them. And, and so the same thing is framed in the New Testament in, in the same way. And uh, so that is essentially how the gospel, the early gospel, within this framework for the for the you know the first century audience, having the eschatological thrust that it did, it kind of embodied that discipleship mechanism using using faith as a, as a way to kind of drive it forward and and embed it in the community of of the disciples. Ah, oh, that's really good, Bill. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, because ultimately our heart in this in terms of helping our listeners focus on discipleship is to strengthen their faith, to make their faith more steadfast, that they would count God's oracles as reliable and they would order their lives uh, accordingly as God intended uh, and and with a a real expectation of the fulfillment of all that God has promised um, in the future. So that's good. Yeah, and I think this is, you know, this happens a lot, especially if you've been involved in the charismatic movement, that faith is trusting God in His promises. It's just that first century Jews viewed trusting God in those promises in a much larger picture framework that involved the ultimate resolution of what happened at Eden, heading towards a cataclysmic day of judgment, day of God, resurrection, new heavens and new earth, all of these things. 
the eternal punishment of the wicked. That was the the narrative within which they were John the Baptist and Jesus are calling people to conform their lives and trust God to. That's right. You know, and so they came out weeping, fearful, and repentance that uh, that the axe was at the root of the tree and. And the Messiah is coming with his winnowing fork to gather the righteous into the resurrection and the barn and the wicked into the into the unquenchable fire. And so it's just a much more uh, uh, it's a better it's a more comprehensive framework for faith to work itself out in. Yeah, I think that's good. And and I think what you said, John, is kind of leads us to the last point that we wanted to talk about today on this episode uh, is really talking about the title of this podcast. We, we called the podcast the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. Um, and I think, you know, even that word um, may be familiar to some and foreign to others, but uh, what do we mean when we say the word apocalyptic? I know I think of, um, you know, the, the classic, uh, maybe the movie, it kind of shows that we're, we're all kind of 90s kids here, where we can think of uh, the movie maybe Independence Day with Will Smith and the aliens and and you know that that was kind of the apocalyptic event and and so when we talk about apocalyptic or we call the gospel the apocalyptic gospel, what is it that we mean? Yeah, so that word has a long history, a long complex history, uh, both in the English language and in modern academic studies, and so uh, there's. We don't have time to work through all the specific dynamics to that, but we chose that title uh, just to emphasize kind of uh, the the radical nature of how first century Jews in general, not all of them, but in general viewed the world and uh, and to bring some continuity with modern historical studies. And so the term gets used kind of in two main ways. It gets used in a secular way, which is how most people at a popular level understand it. it it's the end of the world. It's a cataclysmic event that changes history radically, like before the nuclear holocaust versus after, or before the comet strikes the earth or after, or before the climate change roasts us all in the next <laughs> 10 years or after. You know, it's pre-apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic. It creates a two-age type reality. And, uh, and so Jews viewed the world this way. History is moving towards a cataclysmic event, the day of God. And a new heavens and new earth, the resurrection, the punishment of the wicked. And so the post-apocalyptic is not a dead gray zone, but a glorious, like Paul says in Romans 8. We'd, I, we don't consider our present suffering worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed. And so the two age, this age, the age to come, uh, really embodies that kind of worldview. And so we use it primarily in a secular way within... Uh, Biblical and academic studies, especially within conservative and evangelical camps, the term gets used to communicate revelation, which is derived etymologically from the Greek word apokalypsis, uh, meaning to reveal or uh, to unveil a mystery. And so that's not really our... our uh, Goal in this, though we can talk about it. There's whole streams of uh, of theological studies that orient uh, apocalyptic around that definition, uh, but we're talking more about uh, how Jews viewed the world, the worldview, uh, describing that worldview as apocalyptic. That's good, and and really, like you were saying. It it does it provides the context, but it's embedded all over the text of the New Testament. And it, if you're trained to read it differently, then it becomes difficult to decipher, and the conversation is endlessly complex. But like <clears throat> one passage that came to mind, um, it it embodies a lot of those themes. But rather than just seeing it as a reference to some of the themes, it's actually I'm in 1 Thessalonians 1, and, and what you see is a reflection back on the gospel that Paul is sharing with the Thessalonians. And so he's pointing back and referencing it in terms of the content and in terms of how they responded. So in 1 Thessalonians 1, I'm going to start in verse 6. 
Um, he says, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place that your faith towards God has gone forth. So we have no need to say anything, for they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. So we have not only, like I said, several of these points in here, waiting for his Son to return, essentially being synonymous with their reception of the gospel. You received it, and how we know is that you're now waiting for his son to return. Turning away from idols, which embodied repentance for the Gentile, it embodied a lot of stuff. When you actually turned away from the gods, you didn't just turn towards only worshiping the God of Israel. You turned to a lot of other stuff. That was like the last stage of your repentance. And so you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, referencing the resurrection, the first fruit, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So in anticipation of this vindication by uh, vindication from God's wrath, to be rescued from God's wrath on the last day, they turn to God from idols and and put their hope in waiting for the return of Jesus. And so it, it, references, it, it references a few of the things by name, a few of the topics by name, but more than that, it encompasses that worldview that was driving the, the, the spread of the gospel in the first century. The urgency with which it went forth is, is kind of pictured here because they received it amidst persecution, They turned to God from idols, which was extremely complicated in the first century. I'm sure we'll have shows talking about that. But it was extremely complicated and difficult on their families to do that. But they did it. A little bit like turning in a Muslim context. Yeah, very similar, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the point was, is there wasn't the assumption of you turn to God and this X, Y, or Z will happen right now. The point was, what they it was assumed they received, and they responded in an exemplary manner, Paul says, is that they received the gospel, and they turned to God, waiting for the coming of Jesus to be saved from the wrath to come, assuming that what followed after that was the actual hope of their gospel. Right. And so the gospel, the gospel is much uh, broader than... Just Christ died for our sins out of 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel involved uh, the Jewish worldview in the first century wasn't just kind of a a, a, a husk within which there's this new kernel of Christ died for us, but rather it was the holistic picture of the hope of eternal life as a first century Jew understood it. That for Paul, that means that Christ died for us attained that presupposed uh, worldview, Jewish apocalyptic worldview of the hope of the day of God and the resurrection. And so the death of Jesus and his return were, were fit within that. They were interpreted naturally within that. And so that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul can go straight from, let me tell you what I received, what was handed to me, Christ died for our sins, straight into how then can some of you say that the dead aren't raised? Because the gospel was that Christ died for us so that we can live forever. But the question is, how did Jews view living forever in the first century? And that view of the universe and God is apocalyptic. It's It involves a sudden and radical uh, appearance of God, the day of God with fire and angels, and uh, which brings to mind like Second Thessalonians 1, for example, for Paul, where he says in the midst of their afflictions, like in First Thessalonians, and he says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you're considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're suffering. Kingdom of God and eternal life were synonymous for first century Jew. 
Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and grant relief to you who are afflicted, this will happen when Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. So the gospel of our Lord Jesus involved the whole package of that was presupposed to a first century Jew involving the day of the Lord, the vindication of the righteous, the punishment of the wicked, the glorification of the saints and the resurrection and eternal life. And so this was all part and parcel together in what the apostles were preaching. It wasn't a fundamentally new message, though there were new elements, but it fit within a presupposed worldview that is somewhat foreign to the modern hearer. And, uh, and so that's our goal is to just kind of hash some of that out and, and highlight some of that in, in, in our podcast. And that's why we chose the apocalyptic word, <laughs> even though it's yeah. Yeah. so provoking. Yeah, that's good, guys. I, I feel like a final verse, I think, that comes to mind for me that kind of ties all of these ideas together in terms of how um, we really, the goal of our podcast in terms of not just understanding these things, but exhorting others to to long for eternal life uh, as the first century Jew understood it and to live in light of it. Uh, and, you know, the verse that comes to my mind is Titus chapter 2, where, where Paul is writing, uh, he says, uh, the grace of God has appeared to verse 12 Titus of Titus 2 to train us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And and again, you know, kind of bringing in these same themes that we've been discussing, um, a, a two-age phenomenon, this age and the age to come, this age characterized by wickedness and unrighteousness, um, but looking forward to that climactic, apocalyptic day, uh, the appearing of the great uh, of our great God and Savior Jesus, uh, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ Jesus, as the New Testament would would often say it, um, that uh, really discipleship is is driven by uh, eschatology yeah. and understanding what the Jews were were anticipating and longing for um, in the first century, and and then really characterizing those things so that we too uh, can look forward toward that same hope um, of actually living forever, uh, because this will be a beautiful thing. Amen. <laughs> so, amen. Amen. Well, uh, great to be with you guys today. Um, thanks for uh, listening to our first episode. We're excited to continue next week. Uh, we'll begin to develop some of these themes. But uh, yeah, um, we hope you join us. John, Bill, thanks for joining us. God bless. We'll be with you guys. All right. Maranatha. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.